It's not the destination, it's the journey. Whoever abides by these inspirational words has clearly never driven in Chicago or Beijing or Brazil. These charming journeys cost money and waste time. And get this, there could be 200 million more vehicles on the road by 2030. But hang on, because many experts believe that the transportation of tomorrow will improve our daily lives, our cities, and maybe even society as a whole. So sit back and buckle up. Yes, pun intended, because in this half hour, we're looking 10, 20, 40 years down the road, not just at how the journey will change, but how it will transform the destination. Roads? Where we're going, we don't need roads. Back to the Future helped us imagine how we'd get around one day. We've been dreaming of this future for centuries, apparently really dreaming sometimes. I mean, are those dragon wings? Anyways. 2015. Doc Brown's timeline didn't exactly pan out, but today's transit prototypes are reshaping tomorrow's world. Let me just figure out how to switch it so you are taking up the majority of my screen. There we go. So transportation right now is going through an absolutely fundamental transformation, just similar to, in magnitude to what we saw with the locomotive back in the 19th century, and then the invention of the car in the 20th century. Everything now is changing. We can fantasize about jetpacks, hyperloops, and suborbital space travel. All these ideas are in development, but autonomous vehicles might have a greater impact. By 2040, they could account for as much as two thirds of distance travel just in China. Vehicles are becoming mobile computing platforms and people should be excited because what we end up with is a better world, something that's safer, something that's more convenient. We're still a few decades away from that world, but we do have the tools to get us there. All thanks to... The ACES. Um, what now? ACES refers to the four mega trends that are transforming transportation. Autonomous, connected, electric, and shared vehicles. First up, autonomy. Google, Tesla, Uber, they've all got driverless cars. Most experts agree on six levels of automation. Confusingly with five being the highest because the scale starts at zero. Where would you like to go? Many autonomous vehicles today are at a level two or three, taking on basic tasks like parking and switching lanes. But that's quickly changing. People think this is something that's decades away. It's not. Waymo One, which is owned by Google, is a level four vehicle put into production. This isn't a beta test. This is live today. To reach true autonomy, we need help from our second letter. For these cars to navigate safely, they need to communicate not just with each other, but with pretty much everything. Many cars are already connected today. Say a command or say help. To us. But for autonomous vehicles to start talking to the wider world, artificial intelligence needs to advance and 5G has to take hold. Our autonomous connected cars will likely also become electric. There's still some issues about how far electric vehicles can go, but those issues will be addressed as more charge stations show up and as more people get used to the technology. Our last letter is perhaps most dependent on the first three. Shared mobility doesn't just mean ride sharing services. S also refers to things like scooters and electric bikes, different modes of transportation that people find convenient. So the idea here is that instead of owning a vehicle yourself and having to deal with the cost of that vehicle, you can share the cost. For that to happen, cars need to become smarter, cheaper, and more efficient to operate. Huh. That must be why so many rideshare companies are investing in driverless tech. Well, that's right, because ACEs, these are not four independent trends. These are all connected to one another, and that really is about delivering mobility as a service. Okay, we just covered a lot of ground. And no, that will not be the last pun. But now that we've got the term straight, let's get down to business. When can we actually drive? Sorry, be driven by these things. That's the million dollar question, isn't it? What we will see is a gradual increase of the amount of automated transportation as opposed to just one big change. Here in Sweden, Peter is trying to make our driverless dreams come true at Asta Zero, one of the world's most advanced autonomous vehicle test tracks. Rural roads, city streets, multi-lane highways, you name it, and they not only have it, but have it hooked up to 5G. 
connectivity will serve as the glue between the self-driving vehicle and the infrastructure around it. Traffic accident information, information on congestion, where the vehicle intends to go, uh, that's what you use the 5G, the connectivity for. There are dozens of test tracks today, but Asta Zero stands out for the ability to simulate traffic situations in nearly every city on Earth by combining real environments with computer software. You need to be able to replicate the monsoon in Asia, the complicated pedestrian situation in a Chinese city, the bad drivers of Gothenburg. Don't worry, Peter's from Gothenburg, so he's allowed to say that. About a dozen clients test products here at any given time, like Einride, with its electric autonomous pods that are intended to replace trucks. They say that they can lower the cost of transportation at the same time uh, lowering carbon dioxide footprint. These pods don't even have room for people at all, which touches on an interesting point. We've been so obsessed with how all this tech will change our personal journeys that it's easy to overlook how it'll impact services, like the transportation of goods. Driverless trucks are actually leading the automation industry for a few reasons, like the predictability of their journeys. A truck often drives where it has been driven before. By using a well-defined route, it's easier to roll out automation technologies. By 2030, driverless trucks are poised to transform commercial transportation. As for passenger vehicles, the timeline is much less clear. But over in California, the man who invented one of the first autonomous cars is actually setting his sights a little higher. After spending endless hours of my life in a self-driving car, usually stuck in traffic, I realized even if you succeed and build the perfect self-driving car, it'll still be stuck in traffic. And then you look up in the sky and realize, wow, there's just nothing there. There's, the, the sky is always empty. Sebastian is often hailed as the godfather. Not necessarily godfather as in the mafia, but the godfather as in like the, the founding father. Yeah, I've heard this about self-driving cars too. His driverless car became the first to win one of America's most prestigious research prizes, and he became a world-renowned expert on the topic. Now, I think there's a vision here, a new technology, and I'm really looking forward to a time when generations after us look back at us and say how ridiculous it was that humans were driving cars. But soon, he shifted gears. And we want to invent the flying car. It'd be so much easier if you could lift yourself up a few hundred feet and be out of the way of everything. Then you can go in a straight line. There's no obstacles. It's going to be much safer than cars ever will be. So then it became clear I have to work on this. Sebastian's company, Kitty Hawk, is now hard at work on Heaviside, a single-seater electric autonomous aircraft. This thing flies at a speed twice as fast as cars with half the energy. It's like a one-person drone, if you like, and it takes off vertically and it flies you at a range of about 100 miles plus reserves. So we've built uh, roughly 10 heavy side vehicles and tested them, and we're still in the prototype phase. Many companies around the world are working on flying cars, but Sebastian envisions using his to create an air taxi system. The mission is to free the world from traffic. If you want to, say, double the size of a highway, right, what do you do? Well, you're going to tear down lots of houses and build more pavement. If you want to double the highways in the sky, what do you do? You recompile your software. You have a new lane. Wow. That sounds just like Back to the Future, which 35 years ago was science fiction. Roads? Where we're going, we don't need roads. So if our cities won't need roads, what will they need? Rockets, air taxis, hyperloops. The future of transport is pretty exciting. But before we fully extend that fist pump, we've got to upgrade more than just the vehicles. We design cities and, and by extension suburbs only around automobiles. 99% of what we did was about moving more cars faster. There are over a billion cars on roads today. And to imagine a world without them, some say we have to reimagine the world itself. It's all very simple, but it's changing people's minds. It's getting people to understand that the future is choice in the way that we live our lives, and that simply doesn't exist if we're only concentrating on designing for cars. Let's hit the brakes for a second. 
Because cars are now so common, it's easy to overlook just how much they've influenced design, especially in the US. We've built places to put them, reconceived restaurants, reimagined our homes, rethought, wait, back up. Cars didn't actually inspire much car-shaped architecture like this Austrian house. That's better. Today, over 90% of new single-family American homes are built with garages. But in 1901, they were still so new that people didn't know what to call them. Motor barn, motor den, motorium? Anyways, thanks to cheaper, more accessible cars, the confusion didn't last long. By the 1920s, garages were becoming a key part of home design. And soon, they weren't just attached to houses. In Washington, D.C., a modern garage is built that may help solve America's parking problems. You heard the man. These places popped up left, right, and center because cities were running out of room. Back at home, they became music studios, offices. Who knows? Maybe Apple computers wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the humble garage. The point is, from houses to multi-story structures, this need to put cars somewhere transformed architecture. But when cars become smarter, if they start to fly, what'll happen to those spaces? A lot of cities, what they're gonna start to do is spend some time on, as that demand changes, how those spaces could be converted. Experts in one of Western Canada's most populous cities are at the forefront of preparing for a future when less parking is needed. They've transformed lots into outdoor art galleries and parks, but their crowning achievement is still under construction. It's gonna be a 500 space parkade. Um, why are you building more parking if demand is expected to decrease? There's the need for parking right now, but we also put a focus on if that demand shifts and if it changes, how we could convert that space to residential or commercial uses. In Calgary's up-and-coming East Village, the 9th Avenue Parkade will house startups, recreational areas, and those 500 parking spots. Their design will allow them to be converted into apartments, offices, or whatever, really, the neighborhood needs at the time. It sounds easy enough. Throw up a few walls, add some lights, maybe a couple hallways. But back in reality, this process involves lots of careful planning. For instance, the ceiling heights here are actually one and a half times larger than a typical parkade. What we're trying to do here is accommodate future utilities, be it electrical and mechanical. These design details often mean more expense up front, which is why convertible garages aren't too popular today. But the partners here hope that by future-proofing this building, it will help the community evolve later on. When we first think about design of parking, it's typically, you know, you paint some lines and you go, but can we make them function better? What are the things that we can incorporate now that would be a catalyst for development in East Village and in the city? This garage can be converted at any time. A smart move, because transportation predictions are all over the place. In 2015, some news outlets said that we'd be driverless this year. Yeah, not quite. Most experts can't agree on when this future will arrive, but they do have a good idea of how it will work. Whether it's robo-taxis, autonomous buses, or electric scooters, travelers should have more options on demand than ever before. But to ensure all this transit transforms our world for the better, urban planners first need to look in the rearview mirror. We have to take a hard, critical look back at the mistakes we've made in the last century and really address those in a clear, I would say, scientific way. Cities are defined by roads, which are literally defined as surfaces for vehicles. But in the early 1900s, roads and streets were shared with pedestrians. I know what you're thinking. Cars showed up, it was inevitable. The dictionary is never wrong. But giving these public places over to cars was actually an act of choice. This was partly due to people's desire to move differently in automobiles, but it also was impacted greatly by industries that were trying to move in certain directions that would increase their sales. Throughout the 20th century, urban planners often prioritized cars, resulting in traffic, urban sprawl, and even isolation. That street, which had originally connected different parts of the city, became a road, or even worse, a highway, which disconnected everything. And so it meant that two neighborhoods could now be completely disconnected and have no relationship to each other. David works for the world's second biggest architecture firm which thinks that replanning cities to accommodate for future transit will help. A theory they're testing in Kuwait. 
Kuwaitis prefer driving. Many highways and arterial streets were built. This really resulted in less public spaces and disconnected neighborhoods. In 2009, the UN said that all roads in Kuwait were already, or would very soon, be at full capacity. Local news outlets were reporting even bigger problems. So something had to give. We can always build more highways, but this is only a short-term solution. The master plan is changing that. In 2017, Kuwait embarked on a new master plan for 2040, redesigning today's neighborhoods with tomorrow's technology in mind. Over 100 planners and architects have essentially been creating a blank canvas, removing cars from streets so that they'll be ready for new options as they become available. For instance, this road was once covered in cars, but it's now been pedestrianized to pave the way for multiple transit alternatives. We can use uh, bike sharing, uh, ride sharing, um, autonomous vehicles, and then a, mot a metro system. This metro would have smart stations equipped with an array of options to help travelers reach their final destination. So the master plan uses data and analysis to actually build and create uh, a city where it's convenient for people to use the various transport modes. The master plan suggests transforming over 200 neighborhoods across the country. And a major aim, obviously, is to improve travel. But the larger goal is for the ease of this movement to move the entire country forward by attracting investment. Kuwait is only depending on, on oil today. These t new technological transportation modes will shift Kuwait into this uh, uh, new financial hub. Kuwait and Calgary couldn't be further apart, but they seem to have something in common. By proactively planning for tomorrow's transit, they hope to harness its power to create a brighter future. Which begs the question, will all of this tech make our world a better place? In all these visions of future transportation, people look so content. Is it because they're finally getting the recommended hours of sleep? That they have more free time than ever before? Or because they no longer need to park cars, which this TV show literally describes as purgatory? This is the story of the people versus parking. It's gotta make you wonder, as we upgrade transit and transform cities, will our society become a better place? In the future, the ease of getting around is seamless with many, many options for folks. It's gonna be green, healthy from a learning perspective, healthy from a, a supply of jobs, and people have time back. Wow, yes please, that future sounds great. Almost too good to be true. I hate to say we could end up with the worst situation if we're not careful about what we do. More segregation than we have today. Less diversity, less inclusion. Yikes. How can we avoid this fate and instead aim for a better world? I think you have to start by making a plan for what you want your city to look like in 2040, 2050. That's number one. And then you have to look at that plan and adjust it. Carla is well versed in how transit is changing. I've been in the automotive business for 37 years, and we've never seen a disruption as we're seeing today. Today, she's the CEO of CAR, a nonprofit that could not have a more fitting acronym, which studies how, well, mainly cars impact our world. I like to call us a think tank that supports the sustainability of the automotive and mobility industry. Our future modes of transport will alter just about every aspect of life. You could spend days reading about it all. But since we're nearing the finish line and are out of cheesy jokes, let's go over the highlights, starting with safety. Today, traffic accidents claim roughly 1.3 million lives a year worldwide and injure between 20 and 50 million people annually. At some point, our smarter vehicles will almost undoubtedly lower these numbers. We often talked about, yeah, yeah, I want an autonomous vehicle because, you know, it'll make my life simpler. I can do work. I can multitask. That's not the reason at all. You know, the reason is it will make a huge impact of the improvement of safety. This future might be more accessible, too. 
Groups that are often overlooked now could have more options if vehicles no longer rely on our sight, our feet, and our permission to operate them. Most people in their senior years today are going to outlive their driver's license by 10 years. And in those 10 years, I'm sure they're going to still want to do the things they were doing before. And for persons with disabilities who have always been excluded, this opens a way to, again, enhance their lives. This new future could also level the economic playing field. In the U.S., car ownership is one of the biggest drivers of employment opportunities for low-income families. But if shared mobility services lower transportation costs to the point where we don't need our own cars, that barrier might be eliminated. You'd be able to open up doors that aren't open today. So in the future, the city should become more equal. Should be more equal. As we've been exploring the safer, more accessible future, we've heard the words should and could quite a bit. What gives? If we just put new technology, we're just going to have the same problems in a different technological form. And I always bring up the Jetsons, for example. Yes, they're flying to their space houses, but they had traffic jams still. You had road rage, you know, still bad drivers, you know, nothing smart in the ways of getting around. Boy, the spaceway traffic gets worse every night. So we didn't change anything. We just put new technology. So we have to be really careful. And every time we think about deploying something, really think about that future and then harness the power of the public and private sector together to realize that journey. As today's brightest minds build flying cars and test autonomous trucks, it's easy to classify their creations as vehicles that just get us from point A to point B. But this transportation will profoundly impact our lives. A few years ago, when I uh, tried out a, a, an active safety functionality for the first time, that was a pivotal moment for me because I understood on a deeper level how many people can be saved by these, these, these technologies. These technologies could pave the way to a brighter future. I'm a firm believer that technology like you see behind me is going to be a democratizer and really level the playing field for everybody. The questions we ask today will shape our world for decades to come. What things would you put in place to, or invest in so that you can kind of promote and make that change in the future? This future won't arrive overnight all at once. But if we pay attention to it now, we might just arrive at a destination beyond our wildest dreams.